I'm very pleased to welcome Jan McCartan as today's presenter for our Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. Jan taught English in Sweden, France, Malaysia, and the UK before becoming a publisher. She has many years of experience publishing ELT material, specializing in grammar and vocabulary. She was also closely involved in the development of spoken English sections of the Cambridge International Corpus. Currently a freelance ELT writer, her main interests lie in applying insights from corpus research to language teaching. She's co-author of the Corpus Informed Materials Touchstone, Viewpoint and Grammar for Business, published by Cambridge University Press. Over to you, Jeanne. Thank you, Alistair, and welcome to everyone to this webinar. I should say good morning to those of you who are west of me in the Americas, and I see we have people from Ecuador and Uruguay. Um, I should say good evening to those who are considerably to the east of me, and I see we have people from Russia, South Korea, uh, and China, as well as Belarus. And good afternoon to everyone who is in my time zone, which is sort of Middle Europe, European. I'm on British summer time at the moment. So hello and welcome to you all. So this is the second in our series of webinars. Um, and the first part, which Helen Sanderford, my co-author, did a month ago, was on what good teaching material should do with regard to vocabulary. And I'm going to talk today about how materials can and should effectively teach grammar. Now, grammar is one of those tricky areas. We either love it or hate it. And as I was preparing this webinar, I was reading one or two articles, and I came across a quote which immediately struck me. It was in an article about the teaching of grammar, and this person said, the trouble with teaching grammar is that we are never quite sure whether it works or not. Its effects are uncertain and hard to assess. And I thought this was a very honest way of looking at grammar teaching, especially from one of our profession's foremost pedagogical grammarians, Michael Swan. He goes on to say, practice may have some effect but carry over to spontaneous production is often disappointing. And I think we've all had this experience that we teach structures and our students practice it um, successfully in class, but when it comes to students saying things spontaneously for themselves, then somehow they haven't they don't perform as well as we would like them to. So I think with grammar, we have to um, be realistic. And Michael Swan in this article goes on to explore different issues in, in teaching grammar. But I think also we can look for materials with certain criteria in mind to help us get over this depressing situation that we're never quite sure whether our teaching works or not. Materials that enable us to have that carry over to spontaneous production. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest about seven criteria for what to look for in good grammar teaching materials. And all of the words that I've chosen for my criteria actually begin with the letter C. I thought that would be a neat way to present this to you. So you might 
want to take a moment to think what C, words beginning with C, I'm going to suggest this afternoon. Some of them will be obvious. Some of them perhaps less so because I've manipulated things so that my words begin with C because I'm the, the presenter. But take a minute and see how many C's you, you have. Now, grammar is such a big, wide open area that obviously I'm not going to be able to cover absolutely everything in this talk. But, but I hope to cover what I think are the basic criteria. So my first C is context. Now, a lot of materials do start with a context, a, a text or a conversation. but the important thing is to have the right kind of context for the grammar that you're teaching so that the grammar structure sounds natural in that context. So the main question to ask is, how do people use this grammar? Some structures will sound better in a written context and others may sound better in a spoken context. And obviously, a lot of structures are at home in both written and spoken English. But it's important to choose the right context for the right structure. And underlying this notion of context is the idea that grammar isn't a, an abstract set of rules, but to look at grammar more as a toolkit, a set of tools that people use and choose the right structure or the right tool for the right, right job. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of what I mean by context. This is an extract from some teaching material, and it's a magazine style article where the individual, Christopher, in the middle, is talking about his circle of friends. And it's very much spoken language, spoken context. And he identifies each one and how, how he met them. We're going to look at a couple in more detail. So the first one, my running buddy. Mike is the guy I run with in the morning. He's the one who got me started running when I was in college. It's convenient because he lives right down the street. And this is a, a very spoken example based on what a, a real person has said about a friend. And it's obvious from what I've ringed here in red that we're looking at relative clauses here. And the reason that this context was chosen is that when you look at a large database of English um, in a corpus, you see that the word who and relative clauses very often come in expressions and patterns like, I have a friend who, I have a cousin who, he's someone who, I know a guy who. So this is a very natural and appropriate context for this grammar. And then on the left there, there are more. Then there's Angela. She's a new friend I met through Mike. This is a relative clause without the pronoun who. She's the kind of person you can just call and say, you want to go and see a movie tonight? That kind of thing. So an appropriate context for the grammar. It's spoken, it's natural, and it reflects how people use the language. This is at an um, intermediate, low intermediate level. But let's have a look at a different type of structure, the subjunctive. I always think the subjunctive sounds like a, a, a terrible ailment that you'd have to go to the, to the doctor for. And in some languages, the subjunctive is, is, a, is a very um, difficult thing to learn. English does have a subjunctive, 
and it's quite easy in some ways, but it's important to teach it in the right kind of context. And I was looking through some materials where the subjunctive was, was taught, and I came across some examples like this. I've, adap I've adapted them. They're not exactly the same in, in material because, um, for obvious reasons. And I came across things like this. Someone talking about their grandfather saying, I'd rather he not go into that home. Someone talking about um, a weekend activity. My parents insisted that we not visit my grandparents today. Now, the subjunctive there in some ways is used correctly in inverted commas or, or in quotation marks after would rather that he and insist that plus a clause. But there's something not quite right about this. There's something not quite right about putting the subjunctive into conversation and especially in the negative. And I searched a corpus of English for this kind of pattern and found very, 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 very few examples. So a spoken context doesn't quite fit with the grammar that's being taught. And it sounds slightly odd because of that. Perhaps a better way of presenting something like the subjunctive would be in a formal written context. This is a leader article or an op-ed column from a news website or newspaper. And this is an article saying why it's important that we still have the main news organizations reporting news in a world where a lot of news is reported by social media, by citizen journalists, by people on the ground, this article is arguing that it's still important that mainstream news organizations should survive because they're the ones who check facts and, re and report things more accurately and objectively. So let's have a look at this last, but one of these um, paragraphs from here. In a world where readers and viewers get their news via their smartphones and social media, it is important that the story be instantly available. Meanwhile, the requirement that a journalist check the facts more conscientiously can mean precious time is lost. So it's describing the, the issues involved in a difference between social media news reporting and mainstream news reporting. And we have two examples here of the subjunctive which are in a natural and appropriate context. The subjunctive is at home in this kind of context and we shouldn't be trying to teach students to speak using the subjunctive, using those expressions that I, I mentioned earlier. So choosing the right context for the right grammar structure. Of course, when we come to spoken language, there are also interpersonal issues as well. Because sometimes how we speak is affected by who we are speaking with. The relationship we have with people is part of the context. So, for example, you will speak differently to your friends from the way you speak to your boss. And materials, I think, should reflect that and teach these interpersonal issues and the grammatical choices that students, that, that people make depending on who they're speaking to. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. 
two situations. Situation one is a student and a professor. Situation two, two very good friends. So these are the two situations. And I'm going to show you four extracts from two conversations from these two situations. So think about which conversation or situation each extract is likely to be from. Got a minute? I was wondering if I could ask you something. I wanted to ask a favour. You okay? So, got a minute? Is that more likely to be a student asking if a professor can speak to him or her for a few moments? I think not. It's too informal. Similarly, you okay is not likely to be a student addressing a professor. These are examples of ellipsis, where pronouns or auxiliary verbs or even the verb are not used. Have you got a minute? Are you okay? Would be longer. Forms. So they are more likely to be used in an informal situation between two close friends rather than in a more formal situation with a professor or a boss. B and C, I was wondering if I could ask you something and I wanted to ask you a favour. These both use the past tense. If you look at C, I wanted to ask a favour, it actually means I want to ask a favour. It doesn't mean I wanted to ask a favour last week but I've forgotten it or I don't want to ask it anymore. By using the past tense, it's a way of introducing politeness or a slight indirectness between yourself and the speaker and I think B and C are much more likely to be from situation one, the student and professor. And the past tense, I was wondering if I wanted, is very typical of polite language used in these formal situations. And I think we should include this kind of interpersonal dimension in our grammar teaching. So to sum up where we are for the moment then, grammar should be taught in an appropriate context and materials should also show how context can affect the grammar that people use. Okay, the next C relates to the teaching sequence, if you like, the step that we can take. So if anyone wants to take a guess at what the next C is, this is the one, one of the ones that I've created myself. The next C I've called connections. And the idea here is that there should be a very clear connection between the presentation or what people call the illustration or the input or the exposure, the conversations or the texts that we use as the basis of presenting. So there should be a clear connection between the presentation and the learner. So it should be something that learners can understand, empathize with, identify with, or be interested in or be engaged in. And what's more, learners should be able to see the connection between the presentation and the target structure. So it should be clear why this presentation is being used. And it should be clear that there is a connection between the target structure and what students 
are going to be doing later on in the lesson. So the, le the learner is at the centre of the whole teaching sequence and is able to see what is being taught and why. Now to exemplify this, let us look at a, a, a teaching sequence. This is um, a set of people answering the question, what did you do last night? It's very elementary. It's teaching regular, simple past verbs, affirmative and negative. The first activity, the A activity, what do you do on a typical weeknight at home, tell the class sets up the situation, has students review verbs that may be used, and has them communicate something about their own lives. The second activity, listen and read, which of the people above had fun last night, has them engage with the material and make a judgment or interpretation as to who had fun last night. So this is one aspect of creating connections between the presentation and the student. Now very often materials go from this then directly into some grammar explanation. But I think sometimes students don't always see the connection between the presentation and the listening and an interpretation and the, the reading that they're doing and the structure that they're meant to be learning. So I would argue that we need a bridge that links or connects the presentation material with the structure. And this is one way of doing it. This is a figure it out activity. What students have to do here is they have to find the verb that people use to talk about last night and complete the sentences. So Peter and his wife, they find in Peter and his wife that they watched a movie and that Peter didn't like it. So they're able to go back to the presentation, notice what the presentation contains at a linguistic level. So we're, look, we're using the presentation now, not for the real world content or the message, but we're focusing in on the language forms and meanings. And you'll notice that there are six sentences there and they show an affirmative sentence and a negative sentence in each item. And then afterwards, students are asked to circle other verbs people use to talk about the past. And this is an inductive learning approach, which is very effective. If you can find something yourself, if you can figure something out in a, in a supported way, then it's a very effective way of learning. And for the teacher, it's an ideal way of taking students through the various steps and issues as an introduction to, to the grammar chart. So it's a, a bridge or a link, if you like, between presentation and, and more formal teaching. Now the next C could be C for chart, grammar chart, um, but it's not, it's not, and I know some of you have all have said this word before. This is clarity. And in some ways, clarity of grammar explanation is a little self evident, perhaps. But I think there are one or two elements that we can discuss here. Here is um, the grammar chart which follows that particular um, presentation. The examples all come from the same presentation and the same context. Very often I found materials might bring in other issues or other uses or other types of examples 
after an initial presentation. And I think that adds a layer of complexity which students perhaps don't need at this point. Um, I think if you stay within the same context, it helps students to focus on the core issue at this point. And the verbs are bolded and, and clearly um, marked with the ED endings in red. They're laid out on the page, they're to hand, they're not buried in the back of the book. And there's enough information there for students to be able to do the rest of the activity. So I would say clarity is quite a, a, a key thing. And when you ask teachers about what's most important in grammar material, clarity often comes um, towards the top of their list. And I want to just divert away from this for a few moments to just come back a little bit to context. Um, because I think context comes back as an issue in grammar charts and how we make um, grammar explanations clear. As I said earlier, in some cases, there might not be any significant differences between the written and spoken language. But with some structures, there is. And I think it's quite useful to, to point out where there are major differences in writing and speaking, for example. So if we remember our um, subjunctive, this is a little writing versus conversation information panel, which points out that subjunctive is rare in conversation. And this gives two spoken versions of how people would say um, these things, and students have worked with the more formal subjunctive um, version in the text. The judge asks jury to reach his verdict is what someone might say. In the text it says the judge asks that the jury reach its verdict, and so on. Also, I think it's very often useful for students to know when the grammar they learn is perhaps different in speaking and writing. So we teach, I wish I were, and if I were, in conditional sentences. But when you look at the corpus of conversation, you will find that people actually say, I wish I was, and if I was, more frequently than I wish I were, and if I were. But I think it's important for students to know that people might say one thing, but in writing, they might want to consider that many people think it's in incorrect in written English. And often exams t uh, test this kind of usage. So this, kind, this additional explanation about the context and use of structures, I think, can add to the clarity of our material. My next C is the word coherence, um, things fitting together very well. So there are two aspects to this. If we go back to our, um, think about our presentation of the simple past, um, students have worked with the material, they've decided who had fun, they have looked at the, at the material at a linguistic level to figure out some of the key um, structural issues. They've had a formal presentation in the grammar chart. And now we move into the practice. And coherence here is the notion that the practice activities should have a coherent context in a way that carries on in an identifiable way from the presentation. So here is a very simple practice activity. 
students have to complete the sentences using the verbs given. And the coherence here is that it's the same context as last night, as in the presentation. We haven't diverted off into a new context, a new set of issues like historical events or vacations. We're staying within the same context. And the other aspect to the coherence is that these, there is a coherence in, in, in the items in that they're all about me, my friends, my best friend. So it's about people I know. Very often materials use other characters. They use names, or pronouns, he's and, and, and she's, which are unclear. And while this gives very good mechanical practice at a, at a simple level, once you've done that, it's very hard to do more with it. The reason for creating a context of me and my friends in materials like, like this is that you can then go back and do so much more with it. And in going back to the material, it brings us on to my next thing, which I've seen a number of you had as well, which is communication. And I think this is where where I, I think the key to finding how we can carry over from basic practice to spontaneous production, as Swan mentioned um, in the article I, I talked about at the start of my talk, this is where the key may lie. So after a simple activity like this where students are filling in the sentences, we can then ask them to go back and to make the sentences true for them. And the example there shows students how they can use the negative form. I didn't play a video game last night. How about you? And be me neither. I watch TV. So communication for me includes very much the idea that what you're communicating is real and true to yourself, that it's personalized. And materials should seek to personalize at all possible moments. Because if you can say something true about yourself using the language that you've learned, I think you have a better chance of making that language part of your own communicative um, repertoire. Um, practicing sentences about other people is fine. Practicing sentences about people you know and yourself is so much more powerful. And also, I think at this point, we should also think that by having a practice activity which is about me and my world, you can reuse this activity a number of times. I think we all feel once we've done an activity, we have to go on to the next thing. But when you have personalized practice, students can change partners and do re redo the activity, reuse the grammar. And because the material is personalized, it will be different for each student. We should never underestimate how many times we need to repeat things. One of the things I do as a leisure activity is I'm learning yoga. And every time we do a yoga posture and we feel we've got it right, the teacher always says, do it again, do it again, because repetition is power and that is is my mantra for grammar too repetition is is power
My next C is C for common errors. And I think another useful feature to look for in materials is information about what not to do as well as what to do. So when I'm um, learning my yoga postures with my teacher, I very much want her to tell me when I'm doing it wrong as well, I'm, as, well as what I'm doing right. And I also want her to tell me what not to do before I do it as well, because I might pull a muscle or hurt myself or something. So if we come back to our pair work activity here, where students are making the sentences above true and exchanging information with a partner, we can signpost a, a common error which students are likely to make. And these errors are researched from a large corpus of learner writing. And their purpose is to help students to avoid making the mistake before it happens and before the mistake becomes too ingrained or fossilized. We talk about fossilized errors, errors that have hardened in the student's brain or become hardwired. And so this is a way of, of flagging up to the student that this is something to avoid because other students have actually made this mistake. So learn, learn from others. So at the point where students need this information, we can flag up what they need to avoid. We can also look for content which addresses errors that students are likely to make. This is from a more advanced set of materials, and it looks at subject-verb agreement in writing. And what's interesting when you look at learner, uh, learners' writing is that very often they make quite basic errors, even with the verb be. I was looking at, um, at, at examples of where students write is instead of are. And most of those mistakes are at the B2 and C1 levels, if you're familiar with the common European framework of, of reference levels. These are high intermediate and lower advanced levels. And so in some ways it's it's kind of surprising they're still making this error. But when you look at the errors they make, sometimes they're more sophisticated errors, if you like, than at the lower levels. So this grammar chart is an attempt to address the basic errors that students still make at these levels, like after uncountable nouns and singular nouns that refer to a group, news, information, the public. And then, then it goes on to look at other types of errors students make, the difference between the number of and a number of, as well as using a plural verb after noun, noun combination, um, where you have a complex noun phrase, the reasons for inaccurate inaccurate news coverage, and also irregular plural norms. So it addresses the, the, the kinds of mistakes that we can see learners make when we look at a corpus. And of course, we have our common error box, which flags up the need to be careful with relative clauses. The number of websites which check news has grown. And check refers back to websites and has refers back to the number. These are, these are quite tricky issues in, in writing. Okay, so 45 minutes is not a long time to address the whole of the grammatical world. But um, let's, let's try and sum up here um, and then we can have some questions. 
these would be then my criteria for what makes good grammar teaching material. First of all, context. The idea of choosing the right context for the right grammar and including both interpersonal aspects of grammar, which are so important. Making connections, the idea that we need to create a set of connections between the language presentation vehicles we, we use and the learners, and that learners should be able to identify clearly from the presentation target structures they're learning and to see how they can then go on to use them. Clarity is self-explanatory and 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 it's as I said earlier one of the most important issues that teachers identify. And within clarity is the idea that we should seek to explain some of the contextual issues of the differences between written and spoken English, what people say as opposed to what they write. Coherence is the idea that practice activities should flow from the context that's been set up and have a coherent context in themselves that connects with students and that can be reused and personalised. Communication includes the notion that communication needs to be real and personalised. And finally, common problems, the idea that, we, that what we teach needs to address the issues that learners have. So there are six C words there. Um, but there's one more which I've mentioned throughout. And the final C is corpus. Because if materials are corpus informed, then it is more likely that the best context will have been chosen to present the grammar and that there will be a clear connection between the language forms and their use that the contexts are coherent, and that you can see how people communicate. And by looking at a learner corpus, we can also see what problems students will have. We're almost 45 minutes. I'm going to finish a couple of minutes early and leave to leave time all questions. I can see that there have been some questions coming in. I haven't been able to read them, but I'm sure Alastair will um, will give me um, the heads I, up. I shall indeed. So thank you very much, Sam. Um, yes, as you said, lots of uh, interesting questions have come in. It's very very useful talk. So thank you very much for that. Um, first question from Sylvia. Dylan, particularly um, I think relating back to when you were talking about subjunctive in relation to spoken and written grammar. And Sylvia mm -hmm. asks, how do we make students use this more natural spoken grammar outside the classroom? Do you have any sort of suggestions on that? Well, I, th I think that's a very good good question and and I I think, you know, looking back at my own learning of, of languages because very often we learn languages from materials which present us with a lot of written models. We go out into the world sounding like books and feeling that we have to speak in sentences that have capital letters and full stops with them. And I would say that we should look and here's another C word coming up. Um, we should look for materials which actually teach grammar within conversation, in conversational contexts, so that students are aware that, for example, the elliptic forms I showed, um, you okay, um, got a minute, 
those those things are 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 explained and taught so that students can choose to use them if they wish with their friends and that the materials that we use should reflect how people speak and of course using a, a corpus to design your materials helps you to to do that and to build in these features of, of, of spoken grammar that are that are common but that you won't get if you only use texts, uh, written texts, as your starting point. Okay, thanks. Um, so follow-up question relating to this, it's a bit to, from Maria Jovovich, mm -hmm. sorry, who just wants to check that the subjunctive is the sort of required and prevalent form uh, just for sort of formal language and not really, not really used informally. So, Right. That's that 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 is correct, and that's the point that I was was trying trying to make. Um, I I I wasn't trying to criticise other, other materials really by showing those those examples, but um, I think it's important to show that the subjunctive is predominantly used in formal contexts. There are one or two. Um, there are one one or two parts of the subjunctive which I've I've come across in in conversation which, which surprised me as being quite quite common. Um, but um, on the whole, the subjunctive is a is a written form and it's not a very frequent form either. So it can be left to the more advanced levels. So I think you can. You can spend the whole of your life speaking without using the subjunctive ever. If oh, it's absolutely. any consolation, if yeah. it, it, in English it might not be the same in in, in other other languages, but um, but it's certainly true in English. Yes, no, I, I agree entirely on that. That the use of the subjunctive in spoken English is is really increasingly rare. I remember that um, I remember being taught. Jesus at school um, when I think of, this was quite a few years ago and um, it was a little more prevalent there in, um, in spoken English sort of 30 years ago but, um, but yes really rather rare these days. Um, question um, from um, Elena Danilenko who asks um, whether, um, what, what do you think is the best way for students who English is their second language to learn how to distinguish the usage of grammar structures in spoken and in written English? Well, it's, yeah, it's a good, it's a good, good question, and it's something I think that you have to have, um, you have to have pointed out to you sometimes. Mm. Um, it's not. It's not something that you can know as a learner of that language necessarily. It's something that I think your teachers and your and your material really have to say, and they have to flag up and say, you know, you can say this in spoken English, but don't write it. You know, what the example I gave there was. I wish I was, which is what everyone says, but the more formal written uh, written form is more is considered to be more correct as I wish I were. Other examples are um, if you use there is or there's plus a plural noun. There's hundreds of examples of this in the corpus. People use there is plus a plural noun more than they use there are plus a plural noun. But if you write it in an English language exam, you probably be marked wrong for it. Um, but it's a, it's a spoken form and I think you need to you need to to be told these things either in your materials or in in um, by by teachers. It's very, very difficult sometimes to know that unless you have a lot of experience of the language and a lot of experience of having conversations in different contexts. You might get a feel for it. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I've got a question now from um, Patty Alako Vizcara, who I think was also um, in the was following us on Twitter for a session we did at ISF a couple of weeks ago. But uh, Patty's question is: um, Teachers are preparing learners for life, um, which obviously is connected to you know, why the, the corpus is so important. Um, should we modify exercises from some of the textbooks and language schools use to make them more realistic, more true I, to life? Yeah, I I'm very much in favour of making um, material as as true to life as you as you can. So in conversations, for example, you need to make sure that. Um, that it reflects what people actually say to, to e each other. Often conversations in, in textbooks don't have people responding to the to the, to what what people say. They start their own their own turn. And what you find when you look at conversation is that people people are always responding to what they've just heard before they say their own little bit, for example. And um even if it's just a reaction like, oh, or yes, or well, or aha. And so I think all these aspects of language are incredibly important to, to teach. Um, I mean, we're straying a little bit off, 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 off grammar here, more into to conversation, strategic language, if you like, which is fine. Um, but yes, I, I, I think it is important to to teach these things and again i know from my own experience um you know as a, as a learner of french and going to to france and um having spent a lot of my time with students and and people my own age i picked up one or two not bad habits but ways of speaking that weren't appropriate when I met my first boss when I was teaching in, in a language school there. And uh, one of my colleagues took me aside and said, you know, you really shouldn't be answering in that way because it's not appropriate to that situation. You know, I, I wasn't, wasn't saying yes properly, you know, saying the equivalent of yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's what, you know, people my age, um, and uh, how they spoke to each other, but um, you know, it sounds a, a, a simple thing, but but I think sometimes you just have to be told these things. So, in answer to the question, yes, make them as realistic as you can. Okay, thanks. Um, question from Jacob Olesiuk, who um, picked up on your comment earlier about uh, repetition. And repetition is power. Repetition, yeah. And uh, Jacob says, uh, would you encourage the repetition aspect of learning through drills? And if so, how much of your lesson time would you generally allow for that in, say, a 90-minute class? Right. Well, I'm going to say something that's probably going to be really old, old-fashioned, but um, I, um, I, th I think the drill fell out of um, fell out of, of favour a long time ago because it was associated with language laboratories and and repeating um, meaningless phrases. I th but I do think that drills have a very, very useful role. So on the on on the one hand, I I liken this for example to one of the other things I do is I, I learn to play a musical instrument, the violin, except I call it a fiddle. Um, and the way that I've learned to play the fiddle is the teacher plays a little phrase and then I repeat it probably 30, 40, 50 times. Repeat, 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 repeat. And then she plays the next little phrase and I repeat, 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 repeat. And then put the two phrases together and repeat, 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 repeat. And that repetition is how we learn. Now, when I'm learning a tune, then I'm I'm learning something external to me, if you like. I think there's 
there's got to be a way of bringing the drill back into language teaching, but to make the content of it more meaningful and to encourage students to say the same thing many, many times. And that's the point I was trying to make with the personalized activity after students have done the grammar activity to go back and personalize those sentences, but not to do that activity once, have them change partners and do it again. So in a sense, they're drilling, but they're saying something which is true for them. Have them do the activity in a different way. For example, after they've done it a couple of times, go on to another partner, and you have to make guesses about your other partner's answers. I think that you played a video game last night. That's true. Ah, one point to me. Make little games out of them. So find ways to do what is effectively simple, repet re repetitive drilling, but to try and add a little more support and structure to it. Okay, thanks. Um, a question from uh, from the Language Centre in Abru Roberta. Um, it asks whether you've got any particular suggestions. This is slightly off topic, but I think it's still sort of interesting. Sure. Um, any sort of good suggestions on teaching students um, the use of there is or there are rather than have? Rather than? And have. I'm guessing in you. Know, um, Maybe there is a uh, I'm trying to think of the context here. Um, gee, if if, um, if language centre of Brew is still um, around, perhaps you can add a little bit more uh, context. That would be quite mm -hmm. uh, quite helpful. We'll, we'll come back to that if we can. Um, yeah, there's obvious. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, so a question from uh, Tatiana Rapina who's asking about um, connecting language to, um, the, to the level of the student. So you know, is it better, for instance, to concentrate at, at a lower level on, say, the grammatically correct or the formally correct he were, and at the higher level, um, explain to the student the, the use of the, um, of you, how the use of he was, um, you know, the, the non-subjunctive there, or um, should we actually try to get that level of spoken English grammar correct um, at the same time as the written grammar? Well, it's a very, it's a very good, it's a very good question, and it it sort of goes to the heart really of what language is is about, because um, if more. And it's, it's a tricky one for a materials writer to to deal with because, for example, if more people um, say there's plus a plural noun, then they say there are plus a plural noun. What is the correct form? Um, so it's a sort of interesting philosophical question, mm. and the way that we dealt with it was to teach what is considered to be the correct there is plus a singular noun, there are plus a plural noun, and to encourage students to use that as the correct form. Because they're not going to sound odd if they if they use that form at all. It's going to it's going to be correct and it wouldn't sound sound odd in any way, mm -hmm. but we felt it was important to just flag up because people will hear this if they listen to, to movies or anyone speaking, they will hear the other form. And we thought it was important to say in conversation, you will hear this, but it's not correct, considered correct by by some some people. Now, I, th I think it's important not to overload students with too much detail about every single grammar point. But I think mm -hmm. occasionally when you have these big issues like um, there is and there are, I wish I was, 
as opposed to I, I wish I were. I think it's quite nice to let students in on the idea on 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 the truth really that um that language isn't always quite like that. Mm. Um and when when you speak it's 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 fine to say this when you write, you must write that. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, many thanks, Sham, for, for that, for answering those questions and for your, for your talk as well. Yes. Um, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. But we've got lots of webinars coming up. So in two weeks' time, on April the 29th, Emma Heidemann will be suggesting some exam tips for Cambridge English schools. On May the 6th, Chris Redston will be back for the fifth in his series of webinars, this time on helping students with grammar. On June the 3rd, Daniel Lowe will be explaining some of the benefits of blended learning. And then on June the 10th, Chris Redston will be back for his final webinar, this time on pronunciation. And we'll share the links for all those webinars in the chat box with you right now. Simon is right on that. And also, um, we've got other webinars coming up soon, which we'll um, announce very soon. We've got one with um, Herbert Puchter coming in May as well. So do make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for more news. So thank you very much, and we hope you'll be joining us again um, when we come back in two weeks' time. So thank you very much, and thanks particularly, Jan, for that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.